So I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ann Nielsen, a PhD. She's an assistant professor, extension specialist in fruit entomology with Rutgers University. Ann? Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you today mostly about the biology that we know of so far for spotted lanternfly. I was lucky enough, I guess, to visit uh, central, not central, uh, eastern Pennsylvania in October with uh, the Department of Ag over there to see some of the spotted lanternfly and to observe some of the, the problems that they're having so far. So spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper. It is invasive from northern China. So, um, but unlike other plant hoppers, it is rather large. Uh, the adults are about an inch long, which is much larger than the small ones that we're used to here um, in New Jersey. It is also an invasive pest in South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Vietnam, and of course in Pennsylvania. Um, it has also been detected in Virginia and Delaware as well, and I think New York. Um, but not New Jersey. <laughs> it has over 70 host plants, um, many of which are, some, some of them are alternate hosts. The primary hosts that we're concerned about right now are Tree of Heaven, or Ailanthus altissima, which is an invasive plant from Asia, and that's one of its key primary host plants. Um, from my perspective as the fruit entomologist, it also does feed uh, quite heavily on grapes, specifically wine grapes, which I think is one of the reasons that we're here today. So those are the two uh, plants that personally I'm most concerned about. And it does seem to prefer plants that have high concentrations of sugars. And one interesting thing about Tree of Heaven is that it has high concentrations of cytokinetic alkaloids, which may confer some sort of defensive ability for the nymphs of spotted lanternfly. So I just want to point out that this is, um, this is Tree of Heaven. Um, and it is pretty frequently found in highly disturbed areas uh, and along our wood edges. So you're probably very likely familiar with it. It's also a host for brown marmorade stink bug. So the more things that we can get rid of for here, we'll get rid of two invasive species at once. So like I mentioned before, this is a rather large insect. Uh, this is an adult. I believe it's a female. And you can look at it. It does have some very distinctive colorations that are very different from some of the native species that we would see here normally. So the first are, it's polka dotted. So it, it's very <laughs> colorful. Um, it has this gray polka dots on the, on the outside wings and on the underside of the wings, they're bright red um, with some white banding. So those, that's very distinct from some of our native plant hoppers. Um, it can look to the untrained eye like a moth or a butterfly um, just in terms of its shape. And in fact, a lot of people when this first came out said, oh, that's a pretty butterfly, but um, it's a plant hopper. And because it's a plant hopper, that means that they are a sucking insect pest. They have a piercing sucking mouth part, just like a stink bug or an aphid or a cicada. Um, but these guys feed primarily on phloem and they, are going, they can feed on the trunk and through the bark of trees and on the vines. They're not feeding on the fruit or on the leaves. So Tree of Heaven, we know significantly contributes to the distribution of spotted lanternfly, especially as that's what we're seeing in Pennsylvania so far. So we're, and Tree of Heaven seems to be very tightly tied to its biology, to the point where, where populations of Tree of Heaven are is where you can see um, spotted lanternfly. And it does seem to require feeding on Tree of Heaven for parts of its development. Uh, it does also require its thought to be able to complete development on grape as well, but those are the only two host plants that we know so far that it can complete its development on. So again, those are the two that we're mostly concerned about. Now, the adults lay eggs in the fall, and they're defining fall as August to November, and they can lay eggs on most of the surfaces. I don't know if you can see this here. This is a trunk of a tree that, um, this is an egg mass I found, and it does look like a splotch, splotch of mud. Uh, behind it, right here, if you can see that, is a hatched egg mass. And um, so those are, have some punctured holes in them. And you can see a hatched egg mass in the middle sample um, over there on the corner, on, on the table. They're currently being photographed. <laughs> so the eggs are laid on surfaces, but these are very indiscriminate insects. They will lay an eggs pretty much on any flat surface. In fact, they think that it came into Pennsylvania on stones. Uh, stones that are being used in landscaping. So again, this is where you guys all come in because it's a very essential part of landscaping. And in fact, the population in, 
uh, Virginia also came in on stones. So from an egg mass, they believe. So this, look for anything that looks like a splotch of mud. That's really easy, right? <laughs> and then destroy it. Um, so each egg mass, <laughs> that's what they're doing in Pennsylvania, but I'm sure you're going to hear about that later on. So um, it can be effective. Each egg mass has about 30 to 50 eggs. And in the field, they hatch at about a 60 to 90% hatch rate, which is actually higher than what they get in the lab. Um, and that never happens in entomology. We always get much higher hatch rates in, in the laboratory than we do in the field. Um, they do seem to hatch better at cooler temperatures, which makes a lot of sense because the eggs are the overwintering stage. So the females are laying these eggs in the, in the fall. They're spending the winter, and they're able to survive our winters here, obviously. And then they're hatching in, um, in early spring, around May. So they need that kind of cooler temperatures to, to hatch. Now the nymphs are um, also very brightly colored. They're polka dotted as well. This is just a polka dot. Maybe we should call it something different. Um, the nymphs, the, it has four nymphal instars. So after the egg, it hatches into the first instar, second instar, third, fourth. And I passed around one of those vials that does contain the four different instars. You can't really see the polka dots on there, but in the wild, they're very observable. This is the third instars, if you can see that. Um, and then this is the fourth instar. The fourth instar turns red in color. Um, so the first, second, and third instars are all black with white dots, and the fourth instars are uh, red with black coloring as well. As of right now, they only have one generation per year. So the eggs are hatching in the spring. The first incidence of hatching that was observed in 2015 in Pennsylvania was on May 12th. Um, and those were for the first instars that they observed. Those nymphs go throughout their life cycle, feeding on multiple host plants, and then they mature into the adult stage. And again, in Pennsylvania, that was observed uh, end of July in 2015. So then those resulting adults lay eggs and the adults die off. So the adults are not going to be spending the winter. So it's very different than brown marmorid stink bug. Yeah? You said multiple host plants, but you only mean the Alianthus, or do you mean multiple types? I mean Ilanthus and any other surrounding host plants. So they have seen them on walnut and maple, um, as well as grapes. So, and occasionally one, one incidence of apple. Um, but they do seem to, they move frequently, and they are feeding on multiple things, but they do seem to be tied to have to feed on Tree of Heaven at least during one part of their life stage. So those places where you're going to see Tree of Heaven are higher likelihood to see. Spied lantern flight will be more abundant where we have Tree of Heaven, which is most places. <laughs> so... Um, so again, it has four nymphal instars, and the, the nymphs do contain uh, cantharidin, which is the same chemical compound that blister beetles have, and um, it's, it's a pretty toxic substance, and it can be uh, highly toxic to livestock. So that, that is also a separate concern. So some studies have been done by colleagues in South Korea on dispersal. And what we know is that the adults can fly, um, but they don't readily fly. This insect hops. Um, and when, but when the adults do fly, they fly during the day. The nymphs um, and adults can both jump, and the nymphs can move about three and a quarter feet per minute um, on, on a like, concrete surface. So that's a little, it would probably be a little slower on uh, grass or on wood. Um, but the nymphs can also vertically climb about 16 feet in 15 minutes. So these bugs can hustle pretty well, and they can jump, which is one of the reasons that they do disperse pretty well. In terms of monitoring, as an extension specialist and somebody who does IPM, monitoring is our number one defense against insects, right? We have no monitoring tools for this bug. There's no trap, and there's no pheromone. Uh, so your eyes are one of our best monitoring tools that we have right now. And that's one of the reasons that we're all here today to talk to you, is so to educate you about how to identify this bug and what to look for. We do have an early detection program that we are starting, and I will talk about that for a second. So you want to be looking for egg masses right now. So what's at risk? Any property with Tree of Heaven is at primary risk. The interesting thing about this bug is that it feeds in very high numbers. This is not a, an insect that is solitary. It tends to aggregate in very large numbers, and they'll aggregate on single trees. Um, when they do that, because they're a phloem feeder, and they, phloem is very poor in nutrients and contains a lot of sugar, what happens when they do that is that they feed so much on the phloem, and just like aphids, they have to get rid of all that extra sugar. Okay, so that exudate then falls out, 
and creates these sugar mats on the bases of trees. So I don't know if you can see this here, but there's a hundred or more spotted lanternfly feeding in this one spot. And they do tend to aggregate um, within a single feeding site and will fight for feeding sites as well. So there's something that they're inducing in terms of the plant chemistry during feeding. This large feeding in numbers um, and combined with their exudate of sugar uh, creates sooty mold. And sooty mold is our primary concern, especially for agriculture um, and for the plant industry because sooty mold can block photosynthesis and can cause plant decline. Is that like a honeydew? It's like a honeydew, exactly. Like an aphid. Like an aphid, except you know, five times as big, which means five times as much honeydew. I used to call that manna from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's just an example of what I saw, and this was mid-October, so the population was not very active at this point, um, but it was not hard to find just, you know, small congregations of the adults fighting over a single feeding site uh, on an ailanthus tree. Um, what was also interesting is that these trees turned black from all the sooty mold. So there's just stands of ailanthus that are black with sooty mold. Um, and we also had some uh, wasps that were feeding on the feeding sites because as they were feeding, plant sugars were coming out of the plant, the tree itself. So Pennsylvania is doing some really great work, which will be talked about later. Um, but the primary concern in terms of damage are wound sites to feeding on trunks, the honeydew excrement, uh, and that can create fungal mats. And uh, finally, and most important, is the sooty mold. Now. In terms of what's risk, obviously spread to New Jersey. <laughs> we don't want this bug here. Um, the primary concern is due to that honeydew production that can reduce, uh, cause sooty mold and reduce photosynthesis. In grapes, where they do feed um, pretty frequently in South Korea, and they have been observed in a couple uh, vineyards in Pennsylvania, um, that sooty mold is very difficult to wash off the grapes. Um, so it's a very quick and direct loss to the grapes. Um, so it is a pest of wine grapes in Korea, and this other site here uh, is an apple tree in Pennsylvania. It was found on one or two apple orchards in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, the grower treated it, though, and there's, you can't see it here, but there's multiple dead spotted lanternfly at the base of that tree. And that was right at harvest, so very late in the season. And I have a video here, but it's not going to show up, of just all the honeydew that falls down as these bugs are feeding, um, to the point where you almost have to wear a raincoat underneath the trees. Um, yay. So what is Rutgers doing? Um, well, we can't do a whole lot right now because we don't have the bug, so that's a good thing, because um, it's in quarantine. But what we have started is we've started a reporting website. So who here is familiar with brown marmorid stink bug? No hands? Okay. So many, many years ago, Dr. George Hamilton and I started a website, which I thought would never work, um, for monitoring for brown marmorade stink bug, um, and we put magnets out. We did a very large public information campaign to try and find brown marmorade stink bug. It worked, <laughs> because it's in everybody's houses. Of course, brown marmorade has now spread to a national problem, an international problem, so we thought we would try the same type of approach. Um, so we created a a website on the New Jersey Cooperative Agricultural Experiment Station that has the information that we know to date. Um, and you can report your sightings directly on that website, or you can email slanternfly at njaes.rutgers.edu. You can email myself, or George Hamilton, or the Department of Ag. There's lots of people who are more than happy to hear if you have this bug. But we need to see it, okay? We need to see specimens. Um, however, if you think you have this bug, you're not quite sure, but you're pretty sure you saw it last year, we have a new technique that we've, do we've documented works for brown marmorid stink bug, and we are documenting that it works for spotted lanternfly as well. It's called environmental DNA. It's basically forensic science for bugs. So, uh, like, for, not forensics, like CSI for bugs. So, what we're able to do is find very minute traces of biological material, DNA, from the bugs. And this can be anything like the shed skin um, as they molt from one instar to the next instar. It can be um, their poop, the frass, or it can be the sugary exudate. Um, so we are testing this. Um, the environment that we test it from is very important. This system was designed in aquatic systems to monitor for invasive like zebra mussel and uh, invasive Asian carp. 
Um, but we're now translating this information into agricultural systems. So I just want to point out, when you have spotted lanternfly, you have sooty mold, so, and the trunks turn black. The leaves underneath the, those trees from other plants also turn black with sooty mold. So again, there's these tree leaves are just covered with black spots here. So the question was then, can we sample the sooty mold directly to look for signs of eDNA of spotted lanternfly? And this work is being done by Dr. Rafael Valentin, um, a Rutgers graduate. Uh, he just got his PhD like last week. Um, uh, to look for spotted lanternfly as an early detection technique. So if we think, we suspect we have it, we can go and sample um, at your farm or at your site and try and find it. Now, it's not super cheap, so we don't want to be doing this everywhere. Um, but we can start surveying on places that are high likely to have spotted lanternfly. The way it works is that we take a sample um, and we aggregate that DNA. When we're doing this for brown marmorate stink bug, we washed peaches. Um, so that the idea was that as brown marmorate stink bug was feeding on the peach, they're pooping, right? And we can wash the peaches, get rid of all that biological material, that DNA that's in their poop, and concentrate it through a series of filters, and then look for the, DNA, the stink bug DNA. And we can do that. In fact, we can detect brown marmorate stink bug this, through this method um, earlier than we can detect it with the pheromone traps. So it works for brown marmorate stink bug, and we have shown, uh, we, we went out into test in, in Pennsylvania, uh, that's Raphael right there, and we were taking our samples, and what we did is we also tested the honeydew directly from the end of spotted lanternfly. And what we found is that we can detect eDNA from spotted lanternfly directly, and we can detect it from the honeydew samples. So we're still optimizing this technique, but it does provide us one extra survey technique um, that we can look for this bug until we have a better monitoring program. So uh, this assay is sensitive to spotted lanternfly DNA and to easily detect target presence of, on hands of somebody that even handled the specimen. So it's a very, very sensitive technique. We're using, I think, 60 base pairs of DNA, very small segments of DNA. Um, and we also did confirm that we, have, we can get it from honeydew. So I, I want to point out, um, while we were visiting uh, Pennsylvania, they, Sven Erickson told me, just double check your vehicle before you leave. And this was, again, mid-October, very low numbers of spotted lanternfly. We had a couple visitors. Uh, so this is on my tailgate. See my state vehicle right there? Um, on my tailgate, I removed it, <laughs> killed it, um, and checked the rest of my vehicle. I found two on my vehicle, and we were there for an hour and a half. So this insect is a good hitchhiker, um, but also we need to definitely be monitoring anything that was outside, especially anything that was outside in Pennsylvania, and then was shipped to uh, New Jersey um, to look for egg masses. So the splotches of mud, that's what we're concerned about. So we have multiple ways to report sightings. Uh, we have the Rutgers website. There's the Department of Ag, which is slf-plantindustry at ag.nj.gov. The phone number, I have to read it here, is 1-833-223-BADBUG0. <laughs> so that's all I have. Just make sure you're, you're aware of this bug and are, um, are really keeping an eye out for it.